Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or evening, or afternoon, or whenever you're listening to this. Today we're going to talk about Vesper theory. And Vesper is one of the key components to chemistry because understanding what the molecules actually look like, what, how they're constructed, will help you understand how they function, um, especially when we're talking about proteins, uh, although that's a biochemistry type topic and it won't be covered much in basic high school chemistry. However, when we talk about Vesper, uh, this is one of those things that you really, 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 really have to practice with. If you have not practiced before on the materials, make sure that you are doing the practice work on this because it is one of those that you have to actually work with it in order to get it. And if you don't practice with it, it will bite you in the butt. So Vesper is, stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Regulation. It predicts the three-dimensional geometry of molecules, and the name tells you the theory. The valence shell is the outside electrons, and the electron pair repulsion uh, means that the electron pairs try to get as far away as possible, and we've kind of covered this before. This can be used to determine the angle of bonds and the shape of molecules based on the number of pairs of valence electrons, both bonded and unbonded. Unbonded pairs are called lone pairs, and we're going to take a look at an example uh, with methane. So this is methane, um, and you can see that single bonds fill up all the atoms. There are four parts of the electrons pushing away. So the furthest they can get is 109.5 degrees, because if you take 360 divided by 4, this is what you get. Or, so you get four atoms bonded, and a basic shape is tetrahedral, which is a pyramid with a triangular base. This is the same basic shape for everything with four pairs of single bonds. With this configuration in ammonia, or NH3, you still have the basic tetrahedron, but you can't see the electron pair or lone pair. It takes up its own space. So this shape is called trigonal pyramidal. And this is also why all of that practice with the lowest dot molecules last time really helps. When you have two bonded atoms and two lone pairs, again, you're still working with the tetrahedral shape. And you can see on the left-hand side, they're kind of taking up those two spaces with those two lone pairs. You can't generally see it, but it creates a bent um, shape called, you know, basically bent. And generally, the bond angle is somewhere around 105 degrees. The farthest you can get in one plane is 120 degrees because we're talking about, you know, one single circle, 360 divided by 3 is 120. The shape is flat, and so it's called trigonal planar. Planar means that it's in a flat surface. There's always a double bond involved with one of these shapes. And in this case, we're looking at formaldehyde. When you have two atoms and no lone pairs, the farthest they can get apart is 180 degrees, because 360 divided by 100. Again, we're in a planar um, format, and the shape is called linear. This requires two double bonds or one triple bond. And in this case, we're looking at carbon dioxide. So to review, if the terminal atom and the lone pairs equal 4, the bond angles are close to 109.5. If the terminal air angle and the, or sorry the terminal atom and the lone pairs equal 3 the bond angles are close to 120 and if the terminal atom and the lone pair is equal to 2 the bonds are close to 180 this is something that i would highly recommend you memorize this chart to help you the polar covalent bonds occur when two atoms that are very different are bonded and the electrons are shared unequally. But how do you know if the electrons are shared unequally or equally? The electronegativity is the measure of the relative attraction of an element for electrons in a covalent bond. If the two bonded elements differ vastly in electronegativity, then there will be a separation of charge in the bond and the bond is said to be polar. 
As a reminder of the periodic trends, electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons to itself when it is chemically combined with another element. They share the electron, but how equally do they share it? An element with a big electronegativity means that it pulls electrons toward itself very strongly. So as you remember, the further down you go in a group, or the further the electron is away from the nucleus, plus the more electrons an atom has, means that the atom is more willing to share its electrons, and therefore it has low negativity. If you remember, metals are on the left side of this table, and they let their electrons go easily. Thus, they have low electronegativity. At the right end are the nonmetals, and they want more electrons to achieve that octet. Try to take them away, they try and take them away from others, and therefore they have a high electronegativity. Just to remind you, fluorine has the highest electronegativity of any element. So pretty much if you see fluorine involved and it's not bonded to itself, it's going to be a polar bond. The bond's going to be polar if there's a difference in the electronegativity. The element with the greater electronegativity carries the partial negative charge. The greater the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond. So we're going to practice. Remember that the further apart two elements are in the periodic table, the greater the difference in electronegativity and the more polar the bond. So if you are going to arrange these bonds in increasing polarity, the order is going to be chlorine-chlorine, because that's completely not polar, sulfur-chlorine, phosphorus-chlorine, silicon-chlorine, and finally sodium chloride. And finally, sodium chloride, remember, is an ionic bond. So that's like the, the biggest electronegativity you can get. So it's not even a polar bond. It's moving completely over into an ionic. Remember, most bonds are usually partially ionic and partially covalent. And this po polarity kind of demonstrates that. Molecules with a partially positive and partially negative end are called polar molecules. All polar molecules require two things to be true. This is important, so write it down and underline it. First of all, the molecule has to contain polar bonds, and this can be determined from the differences in their electronegativity. Second, the molar sim molecular symmetry cannot cancel out the effects of the polar bonds, so you have to determine the geometry using Vesper first. Symmetrical shapes are those without a lone pair on the central atom. These would include tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and linear. Molecules will be nonpolar if the atoms are also the same. Because again, same equals same electronegativity, therefore no polarity. Shapes with lone pairs on the central atom are not symmetrical and therefore are probably polar. So remember, you're going to draw the Lewis dot first. Then you're going to determine the shape, and if it's symmetrical, then it is not polar. So here's hydrogen fluoride. If you take a look here, fluor remember hydrogen's never the central atom. So you look here, there's lone pairs on the central atom, and so you know that it's polar. Let's look at water. Water, again, has two lone pairs, so we know that that is polar. Ammonia has a lone pair on the on the nitrogen, so it's also polar. But carbon tetrachloride is completely filled. There's no lone pairs, and so you know that this is nonpolar. And again, another hint is that the terminal atoms are the same. So all the chlorines are exactly equal, so therefore there's no polarity. Carbon dioxide is nonpolar. It's linear, and there's no lone pairs. And methyl chloride, which is what this is, is polar because the terminal atoms are not the same. So chlorine is going to be far more electronegative, electronegative than hydrogen. Remember the two basic rules to determine if the molecule is polar. If all of the terminal atoms are identical and there are no lone pairs on the central atom, then the molecule is nonpolar. That's why ammonia was polar, because it had lone pairs. If all of the terminal atoms are not identical, or there are lone pairs on the central element, then the molecule will be polar. Okay, we're going to pick up this on part two, which will be very short, but 
We're going to cover that on the second part. So have a good day and make sure you watch part two of this lecture. Thanks.